one. All right, this is going to be a fun one. Every now and then, um, I just enjoy sitting down and having these conversations. But with this being the 50th year of hip hop, I, I, I really tried to make it my business to get as many of the people I look up to and shape my entire childhood. Um, yeah, it's all cap. Go ahead, continue. <laughs> continue with your cap, Meatball. Go ahead, continue with your cap, Meatball. Go ahead, Meatball. You, you don't know, know a single only... search lyric. You don't know a single third base lyric. This is cap. <laughs> meatball, just do your thing, Meatball. Go ahead. As you can see, we're starting out the right way. Not only am I getting a chance to end, I don't even want to say interview, because I'm getting a chance to just converse with my friend who just happens to be a, a hip hop icon during these 50 years of hip hop. I, yo, know, please. And I don't know, you know, search, I'm going to tell you, I don't even know how to introduce you. Uh, your friend, MC. Your friend, MC Search. Your friend, Michael Barron from Far Rockaway, Queens. How's about that, Press? Can we just leave it there? Yeah, let's just leave it there. How are you, sir? It's good to see <laughs> you, My brother. Please it's good welcome. to see you smiling. Please welcome my brother, MC Search. There it is. Search, that's that's up, all the lyrics he knows, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> all he knows is that part from Gas Face when Don Newkirk, may rest in peace, said, everybody, MC Search. This dude is not a fan of my music. He's a fan of me. Difference. I'm a human being that he loves. But he knows, man, lyrics from third base. Let's just keep it a bean. I'm going to tell you something, Search. You're so off on that. You're so <laughs> off. And here's the crazy part. It is a crazy part. Search Michael Barron is a great guy, a great guy, but hip hop, and, and there's no way of getting around that. You're so freaking hip. But here, here's what's dope about you, Search, that I really want to dive deep in. Uh, hip hop is this much. Like, hip, the, you being the artist is this much in terms of your story. You have done so much behind the scenes. You've done so much for the culture as an executive. It's incredible. So I'm looking forward to this, kid. Yeah, me too. Thank you. And, and you know, I don't do a lot of these anymore. I'm really, really selective um, about sharing my story because, you know, the truth of the matter is, and again, just keeping it where it is, you know, in this day and time, you give interviews that are now content that people now own for the rest of their lives. Uh, so I don't do this very often. I don't, I don't really want people owning my story. Uh, but uh, in this case, I will certainly make an exception because I love you. Uh, you came into my life, not only at a time where I was uh, doing things in the executive, but you came into my life when I really needed uh, guidance and 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 brought me aboard PMI in the last years, and I really needed not only a friend, but I needed a job. I'll just keep it a hundred. Like you know, I was really lost, and uh, and I'll never forget. You were like, "Yo, search, just pay your way, and we're good." And uh, I did not do that, and you still, we were still good. And uh, I, I loved building Global Spin. I loved building DJ Khan. Um, and uh, I just appreciate you. So I figure if anybody's going to own my content, why not you? I appreciate that search. I do. I do. Um, you know, it's interesting. And I, and I understand where those sentiments come from. Um, we can touch on that a little bit later. Um, but it's so it's so great because... This content, right? Search, you and I both, we, we're at an age where we have seen so many of our friends. Um, they're leaving here. Um, we've seen so many people we've come up with, so many people we have broke bread with, um, both figuratively and literally. And, and, and they're gone. Um, so to be able to, to, to chronicle these stories and have it in the person's own words, that to me is what's most important. Unfiltered, told from, you know, because e each of us, we could see, each see a, a, a car accident. 
And depending on what side of the street you're standing, you might see something totally different. So having it come from your vantage point, um, that's why I enjoy doing what I'm doing. And, you know, uh, I, I know you are one of your greatest gifts is being a storyteller. So this is going to be so fun because it gives a chance uh, for the audience to not only hear your story, but to hear so many stories of people you've been around, places you've been, things you've done. So it's, it's just going to be a fun combo, kid. Absolutely. No question. Let's get it. Okay. Um, everybody knows you're from Far Rockaway, Queens. All day. It's on the surfboard um, behind me. It's on the A-train sign. Wait, I can't do that thing with the hand. Oh, there it is. Yeah, right there. Anyway. How, how does a kid from Far Rockaway get into hip hop? Like, it's not like back in the 80s. And, and you know, like I know, you're from New York, I'm from New York. Queens was the forgotten borough. We know Staten Island was the forgotten borough, Run DMC, God bless them, NC Share, all of them came from Queens, but for the most part, Queens was the forgotten borough. How, how'd you even find your way into the hip hop day? I, I would say that Queens wasn't the forgotten borough. Far Rockaway was the forgotten part of Queens. Um, early on, you know, very early in, in those days, going, you know, on the A train from Far Rockaway, going to Rockaway Boulevard, you know, going to the city. Um, there was always, from 1979 to like 1982, 83, there was always park jams. You know, you'd always hear about, you know, parties. Um, Hollis Park, you'd hear about parties in Reese Park, the Albino Twins. Um, Grandmaster Reggie Reg and the Playboy Club, um, the Players Club, excuse me. Um, even Cupmaster DC would come and spend a lot of time in, in Rockaway and Long Beach. There was always these park jams, right? So the guys I grew up with in Red Fern projects were always some way, shape or form connected to those parties, right? <clears throat> but the beautiful part about Far Rockaway was that if you took the Long Island Railroad from Far Rockaway, which was in Inwood, the Long Island Railroad would take you to Atlantic Avenue, would take you into Brooklyn. So you could go to Vandermeer Projects, you could go to LG, also known as Lafayette Gardens, you could go, and there were park jams all the time. Um, Divine Sounds, um, those were some of my earliest memories, Prospect Park. So there were always, you know, when we were 12, 13, 14, there were always, parties that your mother would let you go to because you'd say, oh, it's at the park. I'm going to the park. So they would think, oh, you're going to the, you know, but then you're going to the park gym. So you'd always, you know, be able to like, you know, it's 12, 13, you're seeing all this stuff. It wasn't until I got to high school that, you know, I started to see the people that I was listening to on these cassette tapes in real life. What, what high school are we talking? High school music and art on 135th okay. and Convent in Harlem. So um, New York City, like a lot of cities around the country has what we call public privates, public schools that you have to um, try out to get into. In Brooklyn, you had, you know, Brooklyn Tech, you had, you know, you know, you had a Bronx School of Science. In New York, we had two big schools in the eighties. It was fame, performing arts and music and art. Performing arts being the big one because it had the movie, fame, you know? Yep, yep. And then music and art was the one they called the castle on the hill, 135th and Convent. So that was the school I went to. And my favorite group when I was coming up in 79, 80, was there was these cassette tapes of this group called the Kango Crew. Uh, Kango Crew is dope because they always did all these funny things about girls, Indian girl, hillbilly girl. And then they had this one skit, Lottie Dottie, and you could barely hear it. You know, it all sounded like the teacher from Peanuts, you know, like all the tapes were like, <laughs> but you, you know, you'd play it a hundred times until you could hear little things, you know, but we were getting like fifth, sixth generation tapes from these park camps. But one of my favorite skits was Hillbilly Girl, an Indian girl by this group, the Kango Crew, and it was Lance Romance, Omega, uh, 
Dana, Dane, and Ricky D. And when I went to high school, there they were, like in the lunchroom doing Hillbilly Girl, doing Indian Girl, doing Lottie Dottie. And Dana Dane became Dana Dane, and Ricky D became Slick Rick. And Lottie Dottie went from a, a, a little skit we listened to, you know, when somebody banging on the table to Lottie Dottie. Like it became biggest record, easily one of the biggest records in the history of the culture. So that's when I was like, oh, they're doing it. I can do it. And um, I was originally told, no, you can't do it. Like, this is not for you. You can be a spectator, but you can't be a participator because you're white. Um, but then I saw my man, Blake, Vanilla B, AKA Keo. He was ramen. And he was way cooler than I was because he was from downtown Brooklyn. So he had the Kango, furry Kango with the Latigra and the permanent crease leaves. And I had a Jufro and I had some whack ass clothes on because my parents were broke. And um, I had favors, favor instead of Air Force Ones, I had favors on. Um, and you know, I was, so I didn't feel cool enough uh, to be in these ciphers, to be in these. So I would just write at home every day, I'd write wrong. Um, which to me was just an extension of poetry, which I was doing anyway. Um, and that was really my initial introduction to the culture was those tapes and b-boying and, you know, DJing and, and, and graffiti and trying to find my way. So, you know, around 79, 80 was, you know, really my indoctrination, not just into the music that I was listening to with my boys, but now the culture of hip hop, seeing Fable and Wiggles and Mr. Freeze and Rock Steady Crew on 96th Street Park and like, like crazy, it's crazy. Like, you know, and then all of these things became culturally significant. Like, you know, Ricky D who is my high school classmate is now Slick Rick. And my man West from FC is now West with a painting hanging in the Louvre and art galleries downtown and Keith becomes Keith Haring. And, you know, it's just, it was insanity. Like it was this explosion of culture and it made you really realize that anything was possible. So instead of going to college, I went to, I went to the streets and made it a commitment of mine that I wasn't going to sell shoes for the rest of my life. I wasn't going to be delivering pizza and chicken. I was going to do this you know or i was gonna die trying what's up guys thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video truly appreciate you if you like anything you heard here today go ahead and hit that subscribe button and if you know anybody that can benefit from this message feel free to share peace and love make every move a power move and i'll catch you all on the next video